continuing on from last week, I'm trying another really odd beer from Kilter Brewing. This is Root Beer Float Stout. Yeah, it is root beer and ice cream flavored stout. A tasty root beer float stout brewed with root beer, spices, and botanicals, milk, sugar, and vanilla. I have no idea what to expect in here. It smells like the root beer that my kids like. Hmm. There's a lot going on in there. Not sure what to think about this one. It's interesting. Anyway, enough about that. Are you wondering what this is? This is too big for my workbench. There, is that any better? I just put the camera on the magic arm. So this is a bespoke, handmade, one of a kind. Well, not exactly one of a kind. One of probably six or seven that were made. A uh, switching box for paging transmitters. This came out of an old paging installation that my company bought from a company who bought it from a company who bought it from, you know, one of those things has changed hands six times before it finally got shut down. Anyway, um, this controlled for one city anyway, controlled, uh, whether the main transmitters or the standby transmitters, um, sent out the paging signal to a bunch of remote paging sites. Yes, that's confusing. Hang on. So I'll try and explain it as best I can. So first of all, this is the main paging switch. Uh, in this case, it was a Glenair GL3000 paging switch. That took all the incoming phone lines from customers and uh, did all the processing and everything, the billing, all the rest of that. Uh, translated whatever the customers were sending in on their modem lines into the paging signal format. And then it sent out uh, one uh, signal, one cable, basically a pair of wires for each of the transmitter frequencies that it was targeting into this thing here. And then it took those three frequencies, those, those three channels, basically, um, and split them out into a main and standby, uh, signal, uh, which went on the least lines, uh, least modems, uh, but not really, well, yeah, modems, but, uh, permanent, uh, least lines, not dial up modems and sent a main and a standby each to a sort of a central transmitter in the city somewhere. Um, and then for each frequency, there'd be one of those transmitters, which acted kind of like a repeater, sort of, but they just transmit it all the time on a frequency, not the paging frequency, something different. And then all of the, the remote transmitters in that city, which were actually transmitting at the paging frequency would receive that on a receiver that they had, and then transmit it back out again. Uh, and transmitted out to all the actual end users with their pocket pagers. So what this switch box did basically is take each of those frequencies, uh, each of those signals destined for a specific frequency and send them either to the main transmitter or the standby transmitter in the city. So this basically created some redundancy on the least lines and also on these transmitters, which are just transmitting solid 24 seven. Uh, with whatever they were receiving. And then the paging transmitters would react to that signal. These ones were just, just straight kind of dumb transmitters. They didn't know what they were transmitting. They were just a, an audio signal was coming in and they were sending it back out again. Um, and then these ones here were proper paging transmitters, which would take that audio signal, change it into paging data to be sent out to the actual end user pagers. It was a complicated system. It was an analog system, but it worked for decades. So anyways, back to this thing. This was a bespoke thing made by some guy in the shop at one of these paging companies decades ago for that switching purpose. Um, there was presumably nothing off the shelf available. So he just said to hell with it. I'm going to make my own and the boss can buy me the parts. So on the front, on the right hand side, we have a little keypad. 
with some instructions on some suitably yellowed uh, label maker tape. And then we have 10 pairs of status LEDs here. Um, for one for the main transmitter, one for the standby transmitter. It looks like they were only using five of them. That's all there is on the front. Now around back, we have a bunch of plug-in relays. Uh, six of them. Five presumably are being controlled by those five channels that are up front. And I don't know what the sixth one is for. Maybe it's just a spare in a socket that's not being used. I don't know. Um, but given the order that they're on the front, one and two are this set over here. And then six, seven, and eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten didn't have any label on the front, but I didn't realize it was being used. Maybe it just was a spare. And they're, uh, they're good quality Potter and Brumfield uh, four-pole double-throw relays. The 12-volt DC coil on them. And the other thing on the back is two of these, uh, what are these, uh, 25 pair or 50 pin uh, telecom connectors. I can't remember the name of these things. Anyway, um, they're just on this board, which looks like just an off-the-shelf board. A couple bodge wires. <laughs> All the best projects have bodge wires. And then that connects through into some ribbon cables that go inside. Over on the right hand side here, we have a power supply, which is again, just an off the shelf module. There's the back of all the LEDs on the front panel. Over on this side, we have a piece of perf board with relay capacitor, potentiometer, transformer, a chip, another capacitor, and just some random wiring on it. That's the custom glue that holds it all together, I guess. And then on the back, that's the brains of the operation that I think, if I'm not mistaken, has a microcontroller on it. And then it has a whole bunch of relays down this side that can be controlled. This wire coming in over here is coming from the keypad on the front. Um, the bodge wire disappears down there. And as you can see, this board, which like I said, is a little off the shelf, I think microcontroller or something, just plugged into an edge connector over here, going out to everything. So before I start tearing this thing apart, I'm just gonna plug it in and play with it a little bit. First thing I notice when I power it on, a couple of LEDs come on there while it's booting up. That one says program or ANN. And that one says PTT, or push to touch, I think is what that probably means. Um, it looks like some dip switches up here for programming it. So on the front panel here, it says for manually switching, punching code 6116 and a star, and then the number of the relay you want to change. And to switch it to standby, 6116 star pound, and then the number to switch back. And it also looks like it had a modem on it. Yes, there's a telephone number under that white tape. No, I'm not going to show you. Okay, so let's try this. 6116 star 1. It's switched. 6116 star pound 2. And it's switched. It's just as easy as that. And I'm assuming that if you dialed into that remote access, then you could use DTMF on your phone to duplicate this. And this actually might be a DTMF keypad. Matter of fact, it probably is just to simplify what's going on inside the thing. So that was interesting for what it was. Um, I mean, in operation, it's a very simple device. The other thing I noticed is that when I'm controlling the relays, um, you can hear the relays clicking, but this LED down here also comes on when this relay on, or when the LED on the front is switched, when the circuit is switched to standby. And then when it's switched back to main again, six, one, one, six star pound one, that LED goes off and this one over here goes back up to the main. Uh, and I assume the relay back there relaxes. Being, remember those are double throw relays on the back. So that's what's going on with it there. Okay, interesting. So that front panel just folds flat. That is actually kind of nice. It looks like a bit of a rat's nest, but Whoever built this was fairly consistent. He heat shrinked all of the, uh, all of one side and the common side is left bare, but that doesn't matter because it's common ground probably all going into ribbon cable and going back to there. Very nice. And the keypad, 
it's actually got some electrical tape wrapped around it so yeah this back of this keypad uh, is a 358d op amp um not quite sure what that guy is there's a crystal but more importantly there is a tcm5089 there and yeah the tcm5089 is in fact a toned encoder it takes row and column inputs from the keyboard uh, there's the oscillator and a tone output can either do single tone outputs or DTMF. So the next off the shelf module that we have is the power supply, which is, uh, looks like a Hammond, uh, GFC HG 46. That's what it says on the screen print of the board. So there is the power supply made in Canada by GFC Hammond global. Uh, it can take uh, anywhere from 100 to 240 volts in 50 or 60 hertz and puts out 12 volts at up to 1.7 amps. So there is the series current regulator. It is a linear regulator type circuit. Fairly straightforward, big beefy bridge rectifier over there. Big chungus capacitor for smoothing with the rating inconveniently buried. 4,700 microfarads at 35 volts. And then just a few transistors and adjustment there, smoothing capacitor on the output, uh, reverse diode, I think, on the output here. Yeah, fairly straightforward, just a little linear power supply. I think the next thing, and the, the thing that we're all looking forward to, is I should take this card out. And it's just got this edge connector on it to connect to the rest of the circuit right there and it has this connector which as I said goes off to that DTMF uh, uh, keypad and then it's just four screws whoever put this thing together did a fairly well thought out job of it it's coming apart quite easily it would have been serviceable should that need have arise anywhere you know since the 80s although I doubt very much that you'd be able to find this board anywhere whatever it is I'm pretty confident this board is an off-the-shelf development board that they just bought unfortunately it doesn't say who made it on it which is a real shame because I'd like to look this thing up but even this thing looks like it was made from off-the-shelf components uh, so beyond Mouser's transformer there, we have what looks like resistor arrays. This is interesting, ULN 2004. Anybody recognize that part number? Anyone? Anyone? It is a Darlington transistor array. Yes, the same ULN 2004 that comes with a lot of the Arduino starter kits and is used as a stepper motor driver. But in this case, I'm fairly sure they're being used to drive these relays over here. Just pretty nifty. Up here, we have some 74HC244s, which are an octal uh, buffer line driver with tri state outputs. My suspicion is that those are driving the Darlington arrays, which are in turn driving the relays. At least that would be my guess. A nice basic 74HC00, which is just a standard TTL logic gate. Specifically, a quad 2 input NAND gate. Super common. Oh wait, HC, I'm sorry, that's a CMOS one, not a TTL. My mistake. And down here we have a CM8870 with a little crystal beside it. Is that doing some processing, perhaps? Ah, it's the DTMF receiver, okay. So that will be taking the touch tones from either that front keypad or the uh, person who dials in. Yeah, and that takes uh, those DTMF tones and outputs it as four binary bits over here. Okay. Yeah, 16 DTMF tone pairs into four bit code. Perfect. Which means that the thinking is being done by this little... Oh, is that the Philips logo? What are you? 87C52 with various suffixes, 
looks like an 8-bit microcontroller. That's not really a surprise. Hmm, this data sheet's from 1996. Some of the chips in the board are 94, 95 kind of vintage, so this may be a revised data sheet. Anyway, it's going to get us close enough because that's what we're looking at. And then this guy over beside him in 93C46 is an EEPROM. So that's where the program memory is stored. Uh, a few other miscellaneous, just 7400 logic chips up there and there. More resistor arrays. Neat little board. I wish I could figure out more about uh, who originally made this thing, but I don't see anything on the solder mask anywhere. Yeah, I spent a bit more time Googling, and I cannot find any information on this board. There's a few other things on here that give me some clues. There's a relay called PTT, which is typically push to talk. Um, there's an LED called PTT. You can do either balanced or unbalanced line, I guess. Um, like audio um, output. So I'm thinking that this may have been designed for amateur radio for ham use to uh, to control repeaters and whatnot because ham radio guys in their radios do have, or some of them anyways, do have uh, DTMF keypads on their radios. So, and push to talk would make sense because, you know, push to talk microphone thing. I don't know, that's my best guess. Are there any old hams in the audience who would have been active back in 97 who might remember a board like this? I would be interested to know more about it. Anyway, let's just look at his wiring on the back panel here. So there is the LEDs going to the front, and they all come off one contact of each of these four pin relays or four pole relays and then the other three um take what do we got here all three pins of three sets of relay contacts so it's normally open normally closed and common and sends them all out to those connectors on the back here so that will be switching you know realistically whatever's coming in but in practice, the signal coming from the main paging switch and sending it out to the various places there. Um, and then all that wiring was just done external to comment it all up and everything. As you would expect, each one of these relays has a reverse uh, protection diode on it. And it also has a resistor in parallel. That's interesting. Oh, that resistor comes from the common side of this um can we see that there yeah so there is a common ground wire coming in from the power supply actually um and daisy chaining to all these resistors you can see that down there and so that's the negative side from the power supply and that sends that through this resistor to either the normally open or the normally closed of oh, those relays hang on how are those wired Oh yeah, there are no uh, resistors for these LEDs up here. Okay, I didn't notice that before. I just assumed that's what was underneath the heat shrink. But no, that's what's down in here in the, on the relay. Interesting place to put it. So that leaves the only thing that I haven't looked at being this little board down here. It's got a couple of ICs on it. Ah, <laughs> those little bastards are everywhere. It's a 555. So, um, I don't know what it's timing. Because I can't follow this rat's nest of wires. But it looks like... Oh yeah, that's that bodge wire that we saw earlier. Okay. And this little transformer's got a couple of, res a couple of diodes across it. Hmm. What is that? What is that little chip? 825A... 825A. I don't recognize him. Okay. That's interesting. Processor supervisory circuits. 
Is that really what this is though? I'm not sure. It is a six pin chip, so it could be that. Might be just being used uh, as a little with the 555 to create a bit of a delay for just making everything wake up uh, smoothly. Applications in industrial equipment, programmable controls, wireless communication systems. All right. I don't know why it's there, but that's interesting. So I'm wondering if this little board over here is an afterthought, given that, like I said, it's got that bodge wire that runs to the back and shows up over here onto these pins, which goes out to one of these. No idea. Oh, I didn't notice that before. Now I'm just going all chaotic. But I didn't notice this before. On the back of this board, actually, let me just disconnect this from its ribbon cables. Make it easier to see. There we go. So this board, what is the connections that go out to the outside world? Every single one of them has an MOV across it. MOVs being a over voltage protection device, right? Well, there's some salvage value in this thing after all, I guess, between the relays and that and the power supply. Maybe. I don't know. I don't have any use for it intact. Um, and obviously it's so far out of use that there's nobody at work that even remembers this thing, let alone uh, who built it or why. Well, we don't why because it says so, but you know what I mean. Anyway, that was interesting. At least I found it interesting. It's kind of cool to see how these sort of bespoke uh, one-offs, or in this case four or five-offs, uh, happened based on completely standard modules, which is exactly what we do today, isn't it? Is uh, Especially in the hobby world, uh, is just glue together standard modules and uh, make them do our bidding for custom applications. I hope you found that interesting. I know I certainly did. Uh, questions, comments, and especially if you have any information on this thing, please jump into the comments down below. I'd love to hear from you. Thanks for watching. I will talk to you later. I'm still not sure about this beer. It's interesting, but I'm not sure if it's going to become a regular occurrence.